What do you think of when you think of a successful leader or leadership? What words, what ideas come to mind? Is it strong, courageous, creative, innovative? Think of those words. But what if I told you that most of the words that we think about leadership might be wrong, or at least wrongly prioritized? Rewind a couple of years ago, I stepped into one of the biggest roles of my professional career. I became the executive director of one of the largest associations of journalists, and digital journalists at that. These are people shaping the future of news across the world. This was a community of journalists, educators, students, media professionals, technologists, everyone who's excited about our mission to inspire innovation and excellence in digital journalism. This was an important job, particularly at that time and even now with the state of journalism. This was actually my dream job. You see, like many in this room, I went to Ball State University too, and I am a proud product of the College of Communication, Information, and Media. But when I graduated, I struggled a little bit to figure out where I fit in this journalism world and space. I wasn't quite a hard news reporter and editor. I didn't want to fully be on the business and PR side. So I really struggled to figure out where I wanted to be in the career. So this job, this job was it. This combined all of my passions, everything I wanted to do. And on top of that, I liked the people that I work with. <laughs> and they liked me. This was career utopia, right? This is it. This is what you go to school for. But it wasn't, actually. That first year, that actually was one of the worst years of my professional career. I didn't sleep much. I didn't take care of my body, eat well, didn't exercise. And according to my doctor, I had the highest stress levels I've ever had. So I know if I was hearing that, I would think, uh, he probably just wasn't up to snuff. Probably dropped the ball, couldn't perform, right? Oddly enough, that wasn't the case. Externally, we had an amazing year my first year. We had a record number of membership. We had amazing new programs that we were launching and doing. And not only that, these initiatives, they were making an impact. We were training and educating journalists across the world, which in turn was making these communities more informed across the globe. And I was getting accolades from all sorts, externally, the people that I work with. I was getting all these positive reassurances. But that did not matter because I was scared. They would find out my secret. No, I was actually afraid. Every day I was afraid. And what my secret was, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Every day was a guess. <laughs> Every day, I had no clue. People were looking to me for direction and advice, and they were asking me about the future of journalism. I'm just Irving. What do I know about the future of journalism? But the reality was, I had a clear vision for where I wanted to see the organization. I had spent many years training and development. Ball State also prepared me for that. I was prepared, but it didn't matter, and I didn't feel that at all. I felt like a failure. And one of the things that was so amazing to me is in all this preparation, the conferences, the training, everywhere that I went, you learn about strategy, you learn how to manage people, you learn, you learn all these things, and then this thing was happening to me. I was like, why am I feeling this way? Why am I stressed all the time when I'm getting all these positive affirmations? But it, just still, it still wasn't enough. So I set out on a quest. I was going to fix it. You could just fix this, right? So I thought, you know what? I'm just not productive enough. If I can find more ways to get more done, I will be confident enough, and I will know what I'm doing, and this feeling will go away. And certainly somebody could just teach me this, right? So I, I did that. I sought experts. I thought coaches, thought therapists. What I did find was a lot of unproductive productivity tools <laughs> and a misdiagnosis of ADHD. So that didn't work. So then I thought, well, let me reach out to my peers, right? Like my peers need to know. Other people in this job must know how to fix this. This, this can be fixed, right? This is the fixable thing. And then the funny thing happened. I would be vulnerable. I open up to people. I would tell them what's going on. Said, I'm really feeling stressed, not sure what's happening. And then time after time, this is how the conversation would go. Vulnerable Irving. 
talks, the other person would say, oh, that. That's normal. We all go through that. It'll go away. And that got repeated over and over and over again. And it got repeated so much, I felt like I was in this time warp, like I was in 1999, and I was in the movie Fight Club, which for those of you who don't know, an office worker joins an underground fight club. And when he joins Fight Club, he gets the rule of Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club, you don't talk about Fight Club. And then now I'm in this weird leadership journey where like, the first rule of leadership is you don't talk about the personal struggles of leadership. The second rule of leadership, you don't talk about the personal struggles of leadership. So then I was confused. All this preparation, again, this was not talked about in large scales. Many leaders don't, they, they boast about all the wonderful things that they've done, how they've changed the organization, they moved mountains, and they're this aha on high. But nobody was really talking about this in great detail. So I thought, conveniently for this TED Talk, what if there was one idea of the future that if we just taught all leaders, that would make the difference? So I thought I would figure that out, and that switched what I was trying to fix. And in that quest, I thought I'd reflect on all the amazing network of peers that I know and what they do. And one of the people that I reflected on was a friend of mine. Her name is Monica for the purposes of this TED Talk. <laughs> and Monica was like me. She was a person of color. She was relatively younger. And she had an amazing back professional background, a lot of credentials as well, too. Monica moved across the country with her family to accept her first CEO role at a nonprofit. And Monica was prepared. You can't get any more prepared than what Monica was. She was ready for this role. But nothing prepared her for one of her first leadership challenges. During Monica's first weeks, it was common for her to walk into the office and see her predecessor sitting at her desk. She was revered within the organization. The staff loved her. She did amazing things with the group. She also had dementia. She would walk through the building. The staff didn't know how to react to this person that they loved and adored, and they didn't quite recognize who this person was. And so when Monica was telling me the story, I thought, what did you do? What? Nothing in a leadership book teaches you that. Credentials don't matter. And when I asked her what she said was, I took a moment and I stopped. I thought about, what would I want if that was me? What would I want if that was a family member, somebody I loved and I cared for? And how would I want to be treated? And she said, I did it with compassion. And that's what she did. It wasn't easy. It took time. It took a lot of patience. But with that compassionate leadership, that is what drove a better position for all the people in the organization. So then I thought, aha, compassion. That's it. That is the one idea. That is it. If we had more compassionate leaders, solves it. You wouldn't feel this way that I was feeling. Research backed it up. Compassionate leaders have more productive staff. They have a better output. So I said, that has to be it. But then I thought some more. And I looked at other people, and I, and I thought of my other friend, Michael, for the purposes of the TED Talk. <laughs> Michael and I were in the same leadership development executive uh, class. This was a program that provided support to us in a number of ways. We went to conferences throughout the year, many, many professional development opportunities. Michael was also deaf, and it was great getting to know him. And this program was based upon diversity and inclusion. And as part of this program, the sponsoring organization um, paid for interpreters for us to interact and, and talk with Michael. Now, there was some restrictions, I should say, around that. Interpreters were only around during our specified time. So if the session was 8 to 5, dinner was 6 to 9, that's when we had interpreters. We didn't have interpreters beyond that. And for all of those of you who are in the professional world or not, you know that many of those connections that you make with people don't necessarily happen when the schedule says it happens. And so Michael was very adamant and passionate to champion the cause to say that this needs to be covered beyond those hours. And at the time, I understood both sides. I thought, I'm an executive. 
I could understand how, if you're trying to budget and financially, these, these interpreters are paid hourly, that you'd want to know what those costs were. And then, of course, I understood what Michael was championing. And I, myself, had claimed to be a very passionate person around diversity. But then Michael, we had a conversation one day, and it really changed my thinking. Michael said, you know, I'm not fighting for these interpreters for me. This organization claims to be one of the leaders in diversity and inclusion. This is a mostly hearing-based audience. The interpreters aren't for me, they're for you. And that changed my thinking. And then I thought about Michael's leadership when we had that conversation. And a lot of people pride themselves on seeing both sides. But sometimes, there's not two sides. There's just the right side, particularly when it talks about diversity and inclusion. And sometimes you have to stand strong, hard, and fast on what that right side is. And be brave and do that. So then I was like, aha! This is it. <laughs> and of course, I found research to back that up. <laughs> it's research for everything. Research backs up everything. <laughs> and so I repeated these conversations over and over and over. And there was new insights gained every time I had a conversation. And I didn't really know what it was. And then one day, I sat. And I just thought about all the conversations I had, everything that I read, everything that had prepared me up to that point. And then I realized something. In all of these scenarios and situations, whether these individuals knew it or not, they were being their authentic selves, consciously or subconsciously. So when I thought about what was the one idea for the future of leadership, it's compassion, it's diversity, it's strategy, it's all of those things. But you can't do those things if you're not embracing your authentic self and being you. And what that means, it means loving yourself, congratulating yourself on good days, forgiving yourself on bad days, and doing the absolute very best that you can. So in all of this discovery and journey, did I actually solve or fix this imposter syndrome? A little bit. I have a little bit more swag now. <laughs> but even if a little bit is still there, that's OK, because that's my authentic self, and I love it. Thank you.